Modern Football If anyone was disappointed with Carlisle Indians' historic 1907 football season, it was Jim Thorpe. As he later said, I didn't like it much on the bench. The lifestyle made it worthwhile. Pop Warner spent freely on private train cars and fancy hotels. Thorpe had run away from every school he'd ever been sent to. Being on the football team proved much cozier means of escape. Best of all was camaraderie. For the first time since he was a kid in Oklahoma, Jim was a part of a family. And like anyone surrounded by big brothers, he was mercilessly pranked. The older brothers locked him out of hotel rooms and handed him olive oil when he asked for maple syrup. When he left his shoes in the hotel hallway so the staff could shine them, his shoelaces disappeared. Once, while he was sleeping on a train, the guy stole his clothes and he had to go out searching for them in his boxers. Just a few days after beating Harvard, Thorpe and the team hit the road again to play two of the best teams in the Midwest. They beat the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, then traveled to Chicago to take on the unbeaten University of Chicago. Champions of the West, newspapers called them. Chicago should win today's game, predicted the Chicago Tribune, and win it through quickness, alertness, and aggressiveness. The Carlisle players got sick of hearing how about how much trouble they were going to have with Chicago's All-American quarterback, Wally Steffen, named the Wizard of the West. On Steffen's first carry of the game, Albert Extende and William Gardner converged on the quarterback and flattened him. Carlisle players never did much trash talking. This time, X couldn't resist. Huh, he grunted. Wizards of the West. The standing room only crowd watched Carlisle dominate both sides of the ball. The only thing keeping the game close was that Chicago's coach, Amos Alonzo Stagg, had prepared for the Carlisle whirlwind by developing football's first pass defense. Stagg assigned two defensive backs to Extende and two to Gardner. When the receivers ran out for passes, the defenders were all over them. Literally. There was no rules against pass interference. They would wait until I almost had the ball, then shot me down, Extende explained years later. I don't want to brag, but by comparison, it's a kinch to catch pass nowadays. Extende had an idea. In the huddle, he explained it to Pete Hauser. Hauser was filling in at quarterback for Mount Pleasant, who'd broken his thumb against Minnesota. Hold the ball as long as you can, X told Hauser. Then throw it to me down by the goal line. Hauser took the next step and drifted back. Extende slanted from his end position towards the Chicago sideline and ran out of bounds. Defenders let him go. They turned to rush Hauser. The quarterback scrambled, evading tacklers, as Extende sprinted parallel to the field behind the line of perplexed Chicago backups. Then he swerved back onto the field, and Hauser heaved a 50-yard bomb. X caught it at the Chicago 30 and strolled in for the score. The hometown fans couldn't help it. They burst in the cheers. The Chicago players were furious. Stagg shouted at the officials to call the play back, but the touchdown stood. There was no rule against what X had done, though one was added after the season. Carlisle won easily, 18-4. They showed themselves as masters of modern football, conceded the Chicago Tribune, and gave such an exhibition of its possibilities as will not be forgotten by anyone. I do not remember a football season more pleasing, wrote Casper Whitney in his postseason wrap-up. Football under new rules was faster and higher scoring, with more action for fans to follow. Serious injuries were down. Two college players had died that year, but that was seen as a major improvement. Harvard coach Bill Reed would later credit Teddy Roosevelt with saving football. But words in a rule book were one thing. Someone had to show the nation a new way to play the game. The Carlisle Indians did that. The Indians have had a harder schedule than any team in the country, and they have done marvelously well praised Yale's football coach, William Knox. The game of this year owes to them, more than to any other, the new development of the forward pass. Casper Whitney agreed. They used the forward pass successfully, as well as more persistently than any other team of the year, he wrote. They seem to be on a train most of the season, and as travel is very fatiguing, the success of victories over the strongest elements in the country was therefore more notable. Carlisle finished the season 10-1. Most writers ranked them number three in the nation, only behind Princeton and Yale. For Pop Warner, it was an almost impossibly high standard to maintain. Frank Mount Pleasant, Albert Extende, and William Gardner graduated from Carlisle in the spring of 1908. The degree was basically the equivalent to a high school diploma, and all three enrolled at Dickinson College. Warner was left to rebuild the football team with younger players. Jim Thorpe seized the opportunity. As a starting left halfback in 1908, 
Thorpe busted long runs several times a game, immediately becoming a fan favorite. When Warner tried to rest Thorpe during an early season home game, the Carlisle faithful wouldn't allow it. We want Jim, the students chanted. We want Jim. Pop sent him in. Thorpe took the next handoff up the middle, smashed into one side of a pile of defenders and came out the other, and rumbled for a 70-yard touchdown, bowling down defenders with raised knees, stiff arms, all the while, while shouting, Out of my way! Get out of my way! The coach had found his next star. Out on the field, Thorpe could forget about family tragedies, forget about school and his uncertain future. Even after taking hard hits, one newspaper reported Jim would leap to his feet, picking up his opponents off the ground with a belt grip, all the while displaying a grin easily discernible from the stands. Suddenly a celebrity in the town of Carlisle, Thorpe took advantage by slipping away from campus to Harbert's Pool Hall, or Peanut Joe's Saloon. Local bars weren't supposed to serve Carlisle students, but exceptions were made for football players. The back room of Moe's Blumenthal's apartment store was another favorite hangout. There were photos of Carlisle's stars on the wall and a private stash of booze. Warner even sent up expense accounts for his players at Blumenthal's, allowing Thorpe and his teammates to charge new suits and hats, all funded by football ticket sales. The boys felt they'd earned it, Warner's assistant said at the football fund, so Pop turned it over to them. Some of it, anyway. Carlisle football is big business now, one of the top draws in all of American sports, pulling in the equivalent of 4 or $5 million a year in today's money. The football team financed a new hospital on the Carlisle campus, a greenhouse, an art studio, and a brand new two-story house for Pop and Tim Warner. Football paid Pop a hefty $4,000 salary, nearly twice what the superintendent, Moses Friedman, earned. This had once been Pratt's school, now Warner, the most powerful man on campus. If a player got thrown into the guardhouse, a word from Warner to Friedman was enough to spring the athlete in time for the next game. The one factor Pop Warner couldn't control was his new star. Thorpe was named third-team All-American halfback in 1908, third best at his position in the entire country. Warner wanted more. If he'd taken coaching with better spirit, he would have developed into one of the best halfbacks of the season. This would be a consistent sticking point between Warner and Thorpe, a classic case of personality clash. Warner was too loud and bossy. Thorpe was quiet and could not be bossed. In practice, Warner berated Thorpe for relying on too much speed. Hit the line, Warner would plead. Run north and south. Oh, hell, Pop, Thorpe would say, grinning. What's the use of going through him when I can go around him? It was that grin, as much as his obstinacy, that Warner found unsettling. It was difficult, you know, Pop said, if Jim was laughing at you or with you. Never the most dedicated student, Thorpe's interest in schoolwork and patience for Carlisle's endless rules slipped even further after the 1908 football season. He was 20 years old, but between farm outings and all the travel for football and track, he'd missed so much school that he was still years from graduation. He started skipping classes, sometimes disappearing for campus for entire days. James was very far from being a desirable student, Superintendent Moses Freiman reported to the Sauk and Fox Reservation. When the school year ended, Thorpe watched many of his friends head off to, on their dredging farm outings. He told Freiman he'd stay on campus and take summer classes, but started having second thoughts when several of his track and football teammates told him they were going to spend the summer playing baseball and getting paid for it. There were more than 30 minor leagues around the country, and hundreds of college athletes found what were essentially summer jobs playing ball. Thorpe was intrigued. He went to see Superintendent Friedman. Told him he changed his mind about sticking around at Carlisle. Friedman strongly disapproved, but he couldn't get Thorpe to reconsider. A note was added to Jim's school record. Granted summer leave to play baseball in the South. In early June, Thorpe joined his fellow football boys, Joe Libby and Jesse Youngdeer at the train station. Libby and Youngdeer were headed for North Carolina, where they'd signed to play for the Rocky Mountain Railroaders. Thorpe went with them. He would later call it the greatest mistake of my life.